you'll see in this slide, we hope to increase our lake friendly living pledges by 500 pledges across the region by the end of the lake friendly living awareness week. Please visit your lake organization's lake friendly living page and take the pledge today. You will find if you insert in your browser lake friendly living of the coalition, or excuse me, of the Finger Lakes, you will find that at the bottom of the home page for the coalition, all of the organization's logos will be listed. And you can click on those logos and hyperlink to each organization's pledge program. Early in 2021, a small team of volunteers trained by the Cornell Hemlock Initiative surveyed the health of the hemlocks on 17 representative properties distributed across the southern half of the Owasco Lake watershed. The focus of this survey was the hemlocks lining the edges and slopes of the ravines, gullies, gorges, and glens within the selected properties. Hemlocks throughout the Finger Lakes and increasingly in the Adirondacks are under attack by a tiny aphid-like foreign invasive insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlocks not only shade streams, but also lock soil in place. Loss of this native species may unleash sediment and nutrients into our lakes in quantities not previously experienced in the modern era. This presentation will concentrate on the results of the survey and discuss what is being done now to forestall at least some of the hemlock woolly adelgid damage for the Owasco Lake watershed. Our presenter, Dr. Hall, is a retired aerospace engineer and aerospace industry manager. His career includes contributions to the end-to-end -end data system for the International Space Station and the modernization of the air traffic control towers across Australia. His engineering degrees were earned, earned at Purdue. He has taught at the University of Maryland, George Mason, George Washington, and Syracuse. Dr. Hall currently serves as the president of the Owasco Watershed Lake Association and is a board director for the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. Without further ado, and on behalf of the Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes, I give you Dr. Dana Hall. Welcome, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Adam. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so give me a moment, everyone, while I do a little screen bringing up in here. Uh, Dana, uh, Dana and, uh, and Adam, Rick, uh, Nelson, can, uh, can we also use the Q&A for submitting questions from our participants? We can give them the option of Q&A or chat. What would you prefer, Rick? Whatever you prefer. Uh, I uh, try Q and A. This is we'll try that. It's been recommended, so. Okay, so I'll take so, care of that and relay those to everybody. But okay, we'll, so so everyone, uh, thanks very much for um, a little of your time this afternoon. Thank you, Adam, for that uh, introduction. Um, before I proceed, I I, I want to acknowledge particularly the. Cornell experts. We're very fortunate to have Cornell University so close to us here in, in uh, our Finger Lakes region. And uh, at Cornell, as, as many of you may know, is the Cornell Hemlock Initiative. I'll explain what their important role is in helping us uh, overcome this, this challenge. But uh, um, for more information for a terrific website, go to Cornell Hemlock Initiative. And then as you can see the other logos, the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has been helpful as have been the uh, New York State and Federal Forest Service and the EPA and the Department of Agriculture. So lots of uh, organizations are pulling on their oars in the same direction to um, understand and help resolve this this new problem that none of us want to have, but unfortunately, everybody, we do have this um, invasive species. So uh, without further ado, see if I can. So I have organized my presentation into two parts. 
I want to go back over some of what Adam's introduction just touched on. Um, I have to admit to all of you that a year ago, so in the spring of 2020, I literally could not tell what a hemlock tree was from some other kind of evergreen, a spruce tree, for example. Um, so I want to orient you to a little bit to hemlocks and their important role in our ecology. I need to tell you more about and show you pictures of this invasive species called the hemlock woolly adelgid, or HWA for short, and share with you some pictures of what our future will be here in the Finger Lakes and the Adirondacks if the collective we, all of us together, just sit on our hands and, and try not to do any, and, and don't do anything to um, at least resolve some of what is about to happen and is starting to happen. And fortunately, everybody, there are two solutions, one longer term, I'll tell you about that, of course, and one nearer term. So all of that is part one. And in part two, uh, I, I want to relate to you the experience that we in the Owasco Lake watershed, Owasco Lake being the third, from, measured from the east, the third Finger Lake, uh, our experience so far with HWA and the work that is ongoing right now to treat at least some of the, of the trees in, in our watershed. Okay, so a two-part presentation. And first of all, um, if you are now, or if you need a little refresher like I, I was about a year ago, first question is, what's a hemlock? And uh, what I've come to learn is they are a native species the third most um, present tree in New York State. Uh, they live a long time, they're slow growing, they're a hardwood, and no surprise to any of you, they have been harvested over many, many generations. And so a fair question a year ago was, gee, what hemlocks are even left now, at least in the Owasco watershed? I also wanna point out that um, hemlocks, are native not only to the temperate part of the East Coast, so from Virginia going north up the East Coast, but they also are native on the West Coast, uh, Oregon, Washington State, and up into Canada. Um, relative to the pictures, very small pine cones, large trees, but small pine cones, uh, short needles, soft needles. I'll show you some more close-ups of those. And, um, I don't know that I've said this quite yet, but hemlocks do best if they're growing in shade. And good shady places are along the edges of and down the sides of these cuts that our Finger Lakes have, um, whatever name you want to use for them, gullies, glens, ravines. Um, so it's hard in a photo, as you all know, to show steepness, but the intent of that bottom photo is to show typically where hemlocks in our region are, are growing. And um, the steepness down at the bottom of each of these is always a, a, a water, a, a stream, often with very beautiful water, waterfalls. And the streams, of course, are flowing down and eventually, in our case, reaching Owasco Lake, but same with all of the other Finger Lakes. So very common tree, so common that many of us just don't even pay attention to the fact that they've always been there, we think. See, I guess I didn't do that quite right. I'll do this. Next question or a question uh, among a series maybe that are growing in your minds is why are why is this type of tree, hemlock, so important to all of us? And the answer is left to their own devices, they grow in very dense stands. Their roots interlock, and as a result, each tree, as I'll show you on the next slide, but th these web of trees hold very large quantities of soil in place. And you can imagine that if we lose these trees, uh, what happens to that soil? Well, um, if, if we're talking about the watersheds, ravines and gorges, then that soil is going to wash down the sides into the stream and then therefore into the lakes. Hemlocks are also very important because they provide shade for streams and in those, in those streams is every kind of aquatic life. Um, 
and they provide food and cover for wildlife. So hemlocks have a very important, have evolved to have a very important role in all of our ecology. So at first, this picture may be a little bit hard to understand. So what you're seeing here that I'm trying to wave my, my little arrow pointer around is the root ball from a fairly large hemlock that fell over some time ago. Here you can see the trunk of that hemlock stretching off into the distance here. Um, but take, take a look at how, how that, just that one tree's set of roots, how much dirt and soil was involved by that set of roots. Um, some of you may know Drew Snell, Andrew Snell, who is one of two Owasco Lake watershed inspectors. And so without Drew's permission, I captured here a quote from a recent email. He said, let me read this to you. I managed to grab a few shots of a mature hemlock tree that fell over to illustrate just how much soil these trees and their root systems hold together and stabilize. Multiply this area, he means this root, root area that you're seeing, multiply this area of soil, I would estimate it to be about a large dump truck load, 27 cubic yards, by thousands of trees and losing them would mean trouble for water quality. Um, so firsthand, just recent, this was in just last month from uh, Drew Snow. And thank you, Drew, if you're on. So as you all know, hemlock trees are threatened by a, an invader that probably came into our country uh, 15, 20 years ago by means of uh, you know, freight and so forth coming in, we think into one of the ports in Virginia. And so this illustration shows you, first of all, what a healthy hemlock tree looks like. And then a hemlock that is experiencing um, the sap sucking of the adelgid. So it's sickly there in the middle, but everybody could still be saved probably if one of the treatments were applied to it pretty darn soon. And then on the right, a tree that is beyond saving. So here's a close up of several important things. First of all, the hemlock needles, hemlock trees have very short needles, very soft needles. If you turn them over like this twig has been turned over, there's this whitish streak, actually two streaks on each little needle. It helps identify. And on this photo, you can also see these woolly or snowy type of clusters. And so this is where hemlock woolly adelgid winter in these uh, woolly clusters, very small, hemlock needles are small. And so compared to the hemlock needles, they're right at the base of where the needle attaches to the, the twig. And as you can see in this picture, lots of these woolly clusters. So up until about a month ago, walking through a hemlock forest, this is what the scene would have looked like if there was H HWA uh, then infested in that tree. I uh, did it again, I'm sorry, folks. So now what's been happening across April and certainly here as, as we proceed with the warmer days of May, these little bugs are emerging from those cocoons. And what you're seeing here is a magnified view. So here's part of a, you know, one of those little hemlock needles. Here's that woolly cluster at the base of the needle. And you can see the adelgid emerging from uh, that wool. So we're talking about a tiny, tiny little insect and um, I go around and other people talk about how these adelgids suck the sap um, from the trees, which is a true statement, but it's not so much the loss of the sap that eventually kills their host tree. It's the scar tissue that the tree places, you know, to, to recover from the wound from each one of these and then picture millions of little adelgids, it's the, that, that scar tissue that blocks the flow of the sap, the sap that really results in the loss of our trees. So this is what the perspective looks like now if you or I were to walk in, in hemlock woods. 
and walking through by hemlock trees now is um, not a good thing to do probably because these little bugs spread not only by wind, they spread by wind, but they also spread by clinging on to something going by, be that a deer or a human shirt, and they spread that way to nearby trees. Okay, so, um, so this is our future, everybody. This is what areas of Virginia and Pennsylvania look like now. Uh, this is our future in the Finger Lakes region and in the Adirondacks if we don't do our darndest to push back on this on this um, invasive pest. So dead stands of tall hemlocks and looking down um, what had been a green evergreen forest of hemlocks instead becoming dead trees gradually rotting away and falling. So um, I'm hinting that there are though some, some solutions. Um, as part of that, that information, the hemlocks that grow here on the East Coast so far have no natural predators. Now the same variety of tree, as I mentioned earlier, grows on the West Coast in Oregon and Washington State and Canada. And out there, for whatever reason, I, I don't know, or at least don't know yet, um, on the West Coast, two types of little predators. One is a beetle, and you can see it pictured right here. And you can see that it must be tiny because there are hemlock ne needles, which are very small. And it's chomping away inside one of those little woolly clusters. So out on the West Coast is this type of beetle. And also out on the West Coast is a type of fly, a silver fly, also very little. Those two have evolved and feed on the hemlock woolly adelgid and the hemlocks out there so that there's a biological balance, a, a teeter-totter, if you will. But back here, we don't yet, yet have any such natural predators. So my second paragraph of text here says, Maybe 10 years from now or 12 years from now, we will have uh, the, these predator insects because that's the main focus of what the people at the Cornell Hemlock Initiative are doing is bringing these insects from the West Coast back here to the East Coast. They've done their best to determine that there's no harmful effect from introducing these two new, new insects, uh, but it's gonna take time to get those populations instantiated so until that time, so that's our longer term solution. That's where we wanna go, um, biologic control by insects. But until that happens, our only solution is targeted, and notice that word is underlined, targeted application of insecticide. And this insecticide, as my next couple dashes here point out, is sprayed only on the tree trunks, the trunk of each tree that we want to save. Unfortunately, we don't have enough money and no one probably will. There'll be lots of trees that we won't be able to save, but those that are considered to be critical to holding the soil in place on the sides of these ravines and gullies, critical to the health of our lakes and our, our drinking water and our recreational use and economies and so forth, this insecticide gets sprayed on their tree trunks. I'll show you a picture of that a little later. And here in New York State, that can only be done by certified professionals. So um, that's, that's our challenge over the next 10 or 12 years is to do targeted spraying. And we're constrained, of course, by money to pay these professionals. We're constrained by money to buy the insecticide or to reimburse them for the insecticide they buy. And there are only a few of these certified professionals in, in the state. Fortunately, two of them are now under contract to AULA for the spraying that I'm going to talk to you about in the Owasco watershed. So there are solutions, a longer term solution, if we can just forestall and keep our hemlocks, at least many of the hemlocks alive through targeted insecticide application. I don't know why I keep doing that, everyone. Forgive me. OK. 
Okay, so finally, having staggered through part one, here's part two. I, I now want to tell you about the path that we in the Owasco Lake watershed have traversed and what is going on right now as we all sit and talk and listen. So a year ago, right now, just spring, summer of 2020, believe it or not, we couldn't find anyone who even had knowledge of, or at least could put on a map, could point us to a map of where the Wasco watersheds, gorges, gullies, ravines, glens, whatever name you prefer to use, where they were even located. Uh, further, we couldn't find any inventory or census of how many hemlocks still survive after generations and generations of being harvested. And of course, not knowing um, uh, how many remain, we had no measure of which ones were still healthier or how sick that our trees were. So that was the status a year ago now, just in the summer of 2020. So fortunately, as I said, we turned to the Cornell Hemlock Initiative and they deserve all the credit in the world for getting a group of us novices educated, not only to know what a hemlock looks like, but also everything about what we have since done. So this little map on the side, this is the lower half roughly of Owasco Lake, this blue obviously, and the watershed itself extends down past Moravia. Uh, this area that's outlined here is Fillmore Glen State Park. All of these other odd shaped outlines are, if not all, are certainly most of the other ravines and gullies in the Owasco Lake watershed. So first thing I want you to be impressed by is, boy, there are a lot of them. And secondly, many of them are quite large. So uh, this map was pulled together by Carolyn Marshner at the Cornell Hemlock Initiative. Uh, her nickname is Carrie. So Carrie, I don't know if you're listening, but thank you, thank you for giving us, first of all, this perspective. And then um, Carrie went on using Google Earth, looking down on these each of these cuts, let me call them cuts, using Google Earth and her experience to provide us uh, a prioritized, colorized hemlock searching map, which is what you see on the left. So this became, in the fall of 2020 and early part of 2021, our, our roadmap. We call it Carrie's map, obviously. All of these sites around Owasco Lake are owned by private individuals. The only place that is public property here is Fillmore Glen State Park. I and mean, if you can read 50, number 54 down here, if I can move my pointer there, can't find my pointer. Anyway, 54 is Fillmore Glen State Park. Looks kind of like a fish skeleton to me. And, um, so last summer, across last year, our concern was getting heightened as we learned about this invasion. And we started seeing pictures of dead hemlock stands from Virginia and then Pennsylvania and even the Southern part of New York State. And we heard that HWA had been found pretty extensive outbreak in Fillmore Glen, boy, right in our Wasco Lake neighborhood, obviously. So, um, Carrie's team at the Cornell Hemlock Initiative trained a small group of us, uh, us being a Wasco Watershed Lake Associate Association members, as well as some a few others that were not members of AULA. And um, I spent the fall of 2020 with Carrie's guidance using public tax records because uh, they identified who the property owners were of each of these sites. And in most cases, multiple property owners, you know, share a given ravine or whatever, share the ownership of it. And since we all now use cell phones, one of the hardest parts of all of this was just getting valid phone numbers to reach out and contact these private property owners. But this was our roadmap 
that we use to build up an indicative, a representative census or survey of hemlocks and their health in the Owasco Lake watershed. So some of you may remember that early in 2021, those first couple of weeks of January were very mild weather, some light snowfall, temperatures in the 30s, maybe low 40s. And uh, a few of us even allowed ourselves to begin to think that, well, maybe winter wouldn't be much, which is very worse in, a very worse in thought also. But in that first couple of weeks of January, this small team of volunteers, all of us having been trained by Cornell, um, hiked, climbed, surveyed 17 of these watershed properties. And we focused on just the ravines, gullies, gorges, glens. And we rated, given the training from Cornell, we rated the severity of what we found, HWA, as red circles, if it was, in our opinion, heavily infested in January. Uh, orange if they were infested, but maybe a, a, a bit less, and then yellow and green. Green being, despite our best efforts, we couldn't find any HWA there. And I, and I want to comment, folks, that this invasive spest, pest is moving north, is moving from the south, going north. And so we had thought that we would find particularly HWA in the southern part of the watershed, down around Moravia, as had been found in Fillmore Glen State Park. But to our surprise, the HWA wasn't then in those areas. Did you see where the green circles are? And instead we found it more in the uh, lower part of the lake watershed itself, um, the Southern part of, of the Owasco Lake. I mentioned earlier that all of these sites were on private property. We we used an application on our cell phones to be sure that with the owner's permission, we didn't uh, trespass on anybody else's property. And in some cases, the owners of the property even hiked with us. The good news, everybody, is we found thousands of hemlocks, not 50s or hundreds, but thousands of hemlocks along and down the steep slides, sides of each of these cuts. But the bad news is about two thirds of these locations were infested with HWA. So two thirds of 17, and we only looked at 17 sites. You can see there are lots of others yet to be looked at. Two thirds of 17 is about 12. So um, 12 sites became the start of what I next wanna tell you about. Oh, here's a, a photo, again, trying to show you in early January, what walking, hiking around these places looked like, light snowfall, but enough snow to hide underlying, you know, fallen limbs and leaves and stuff. Very steep slopes in most cases. Um, ice covering these parts of the stream down below or encasing the watershed. That was quite scenic. A couple of water, watersheds encased by like ice tunnels. But um, the point I want to make to you is walking out on these private properties, this is what a hemlock forest looks like. This one looks pretty healthy, um, at least in the photo. And so that's the, the territory that the small group of volunteers um, took on in early January to build up a representative inventory. Uh, we, I know that was COVID-19. We were very much aware of COVID-19. And so we found that we did best if we worked in, in twos, both from a physical safety standpoint, you don't wanna be on these slopes all by yourself, but also we could maintain COVID separation that way. And so this is what we were finding, or we didn't want to find, but this is what we were finding. We turned over hemlock branches on a number of trees in each ravine, 50, 60 trees, wherever we could reach the branches and trees that were infested during the winter time had these woolly clusters, as you can see, these, these white little balls right where the hemlock needles attached to the twigs. And um, if there were several branches with this number of balls on it, we certainly rated that as 
an orange infestation, if not a red. So this is right on, this is a pretty heavily infested tree. Many of the places that we had the privilege of checking out uh, were very scenic. This happens to be Decker Creek. It's just west of Moravia. Uh, all of the greenness you see here are hemlock trees. So you can see how they are, you know, not a, not now a dense population in this forest. Deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves have filled in, but still many hemlocks, hemlocks close to the stream. And um, this is typically what these ravines look like. Okay, so um, right now, early May, where are we in this whole challenge? So completed, you can put a check mark beside that first bullet. We now have a representative hemlock inventory uh, for the Wasco watershed. Very incomplete, as you saw, there are lots and lots of other ravines yet to be checked, but um, we looked at 17 and we found, unfortunately, that two thirds of the hemlocks, two thirds of the ravines that we looked at, the hemlocks were infested. Um, in some places, we judged it to be heavily infested. We now know, we didn't a year ago, a, a year ago, but we now know from the work of the people, the experts at Cornell, that predator insects are being brought from the West Coast back to the East Coast, but that's a long-term uh, program to get them installed, get them stable. And so we, um, none of us, everybody listening here can sit on our hands. That's not a solution at all. And so, in the case of Aula, we have stepped up to a probably 10 to 12 year targeted insecticide treatment program. And our starting money is $25,000 that was donated by Aula. Um, until recently, we, did, we had no idea how far that money would go. 25,000 sounds like a lot of money, but when you're out in, in uh, these forests, you realize there are thousands of trees, all of which will die if they're not treated. And um, $25,000 won't go very far. So uh, in, in that overall domain. So what we arbitrarily did, we all arbitrarily did was say, okay, let's pick the, let's, let's take this $25,000 divided into $5,000 increments and do as many trees at five of those ravines as $5,000 will do. So that's the work that is underway now. So several, so I want to make several comments uh, relative to this chart. <clears throat> First of all, let, let me explain the words. I mentioned that this targeted insecticide spraying is against the trunk of the trees. That's called basal bark spraying. In the case of uh, the southern part of our watershed, that began in late March. It's ongoing through last week and ongoing, I don't know about this week, but ongoing through uh, May and June. The spring spraying season is April, May, and June. Um, certified sprayers, such as the gentleman you see pictured here, have uh, treated about 1,550 trees so far. And um, that is the result of about 80 hours of spraying labor. We know that of our $25,000 pot of money, to date, we've spent 8,500 treating those 1,550 trees. So some simple math would tell you that the cost that we are experiencing so far is about $5.50 per tree. Um, split, as you can see there in that cost line, about 60% of that is paying for the professionals, 40% is reimbursing them for the insecticide that they are buying. Now, let me make a couple comments about the photo on the left. Um, in our region, there are, are very few certified applicator people. The gentleman you see pictured here is Jim Engel from Geneva. Um, Jim is the owner and manager of um, 
um, a nursery there in Geneva, whose name is escaping me, of course, right now. But Jim and an assistant are under contract to Aula, and they are the ones who so far have been doing the, the work on this. Another gentleman is also under contract to Aula. His name is Zeb Strickland. Uh, Zeb will be joining the fight very soon now. And uh, between them, we will exhaust our $25,000 doing as many trees as we can. A question that came that was in our mind, we all uh, novices minds um, early on was, well, will these guys choose to spray the smaller trees and let the older trees die or will they choose to spray the larger trees? And the answer to that is illustrated in this photo. Um, as you can see by larger tree, I mean a tree like Jim is spraying here and they explained that these larger trees, first of all, hold a lot more soil in place. Their root mass is much larger than a younger tree. And they also produce more cones to hopefully um, you know, replant their species as, as the uh, disease kills off trees that unfortunately we didn't, did not treat. Secondly, this illustrates basal bark spraying. Jim on this tree sprayed all around, 360 degrees around this tree. It looks white when the insecticide and water is first applied. That quickly changes to just a wet appearance and then um, becomes um, you know, dry in a very short period of time. Um, I want you to understand everyone that by no means are we spraying the ground we're being very, very careful about getting any spray in the stream. In fact, hemlocks that are shading the stream get a different treatment, and that is to drill little holes in the trunk and pump the insecticide into those holes. Um, and let's see, any other comments here? Oh, I also want to again remark on the steepness of the territory that these guys are are working in, you can see, I hope, a rope tether, I'm putting my white arrow, and that white tether is tied to Jim's waist. He's on a, a very steep side of a ravine down here, a little ways from him is this stream. And so, uh, slow pace for them, uh, in, in, as I said, in 80 hours of work, he and his assistant have done between 1,500 and 1,600 trees so far. Okay, so that may be everything I can tell you. And of course, thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't rattle on too long. I'm by no means an expert. I know, I think a lot more than I did, I, for sure a lot more than I did a year ago now. There's my, my email if you wanna contact me that way. I would also, I should have put it on the screen, uh, urge you to go to Cornell Hemlock Initiative, just Google those three words, Cornell Hemlock Initiative. Excellent website, full of information. And, um, but that's a way to reach out to us. And I guess with that, Rick, um, as our chat room or Q and A monitor, I'll pause and maybe there are, is a question or two. Uh, thank you, Dana, excellent. Uh, the, if you look under Q and A, uh, Frank Moses has a question that you might be able to read in the in the verse. Have me read it out, but uh, about the. Doug okay, Clark. so here's a question for Frank Moses. Frank, as many of you know, is the executive director of the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. So, uh, Frank first starts out by stroking my feathers, saying, "Great presentation as always, Dana." Um, yesterday, Doug Tallamy seem to be skeptical of biocontrols or predator insects due to their inability to winter. Not sure if silver flies were, were included in those predators that Doug referred to. Who would be most knowledgeable about the research related to silver flies? And Frank, if you would permit also that type of beetle, so two predator insects that are currently helping with Western hemlocks. Is it Carrie Marshner or one of her colleagues? And they, Short answer of that, Frank and everybody, is Carrie um, 
it, it would be a perfect person to reach out to. You can uh, contact her through that Cornell Hemlock Initiative site. Carrie, I don't know if you are listening in today, but if you are, maybe type into the Q&A box um, your email and phone number, if you will. But, but um, also, Frank, and further elaboration on this answer, over the past several years, this question of whether these insects would winter over in our climate as opposed to the West Coast is what the Cornell experts have focused on. And I think they are satisfied that they do winter over okay. It's a matter of building up the population. Okay, Dana, we have another question. Leslie Webster, how is it determined when it is too late to save an infected tree by spraying the trunk? Who could be contacted to do this for property owners living along the lake? Yeah, so I've, I've learned that even a hemlock tree that is looking very sickly, like that middle one on my earlier chart, can probably be saved. Um, it, it, the crown gets very thin. Most of the branches are, will be dead, look dead. But um, there are two, Leslie, there are two chemicals that can be applied, either as a mix or separately. Um, a, a chemical called Dinodofuran, di, which commercially is known as safari, is used when a tree is well along its um, sickness path. Uh, the good thing about that chemical is it has instant stopping power. It's, it's sprayed on the trunk, just as, as you see in this photo here. It's sprayed on the trunk, but um, as soon as the sap carries that up to the twigs and so forth, it stops the HWA, kills the HWA, um, but its effectiveness lasts only about a year. So that's where this second chemical comes in. The second chemical is imidacloprid, imidacloprid and um, it is about a, costs about a third of what the more expensive uh, dinodeferrin glass its downside a little bit is um, it takes about a year to become effective, but then its effectiveness period lasts five to seven years. So the challenge ahead of all of us is, gee, if we have this time frame of 10 to 12 years, yes, we're going to have to go back and treat the same trees again, but um, uh, both to stretch our money and to get maximum longevity from the spray, we're, we're using so far exclusively the uh, cheaper Diana Dufferin as our treatment chemical. And to clarify that, Diana Dufferin is the one that lasts five to seven years. Is that what he's spraying on the tree right now in this picture? Yeah, no, no, Rick, uh, just reverse what you just said. The Diana Dufferin is the instant stop. As soon as the sap carries it up to the twigs, instant stop, but it only lasts about a year. And then it would have to be reapplied. So the other chemical, which is imidacloprid, you'll find both of these on the Cornell Hemlock Initiative website, is both cheaper and lasts longer, but it takes a bit longer to become, to have an effect on the HWA. And the second part of your question, Leslie, uh, was um, who can be contacted to do this? In our region, certain New York State certified applicator people are kind of rare, uh, from other parts of the state, you could pay them probably to drive in and, and so forth. But in our immediate area, uh, I think I'm pretty accurate if I say there are just two or very few number. Uh, one is uh, Zeb Strickland, I've mentioned, and the other is this gentleman, uh, Jim Engel. May I proceed, Rick? Yeah, go ahead. Can you, you have the Q&A in front of you to answer? Yeah, I, I do. I just need to pull it down here a little bit. Okay, it might be easier to see. Um, Dr. Jim Tift asks, is the spray treatment necessary on a yearly basis? Jim, the answer is no or yes. If you use the more expensive instant acting chemical because your trees are badly infected, 
if you have somebody use that, not you, but a professional put that on, then the answer becomes yes, and it becomes a very expensive situation. But if instead you either mix it with the cheaper one, which lasts five to seven years, then you're into, you know, every six years or so retreating your trees. Next question from Kathleen Abertini. Uh, what about further north along the lake? Um, so Aula is interested primarily in the, preserving the water quality of the lake, which means that we put blinders on intentionally to hemlocks that are not critical to holding the soil in place so that it doesn't move down into the stream and into the lake. Those are the only hemlocks, I'm sorry to say, the only hemlocks that we Aula are focused on. That leaves out then many hundreds and thousands of other hemlocks, including those along the northern part of the lake, that at least the money that Aula has and the money that Aula will be trying to raise, uh, we won't be applying it to those. Those hemlocks further north are also very valuable, especially if they're on your property, say in the, say in the obvious on your farm or within your sight distance, we don't wanna see any of the trees die. Um, and so contacting a private individual and paying for their treatment yourself is, is a viable path. It's just that these individuals are very much in demand. Uh, Dana, I think you have one more uh, farther down, Ben Zimmerman. Uh, yes, Ben, ben you asked, uh, you can find qualified, okay, so here's some good information. You can find qualified pesticide technicians and applicators on the New York State DEC pesticide portal. I work for Applied Ecological Services and Resource Environmental Solutions out of Waterloo. Uh, we make these applications as well. Good, Ben. Thank you for, for entering that. I, I didn't want to, I knew I was uh, speaking wrong, but I didn't know who else to point people to. So the New York State DEC pesticide portal. And related to that, Dana, Rick, again, uh, Teresa Link sent in the chat box, a link to the DEC page with all the pesticide applicators in the state. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Teresa. It's a NYSPAD. And uh, I, Dana, I had a question that, are they applying the insecticide out west since they have these two bugs that take care of things or are they doing both? A good, good question, Rick. Uh, my understanding is they are not applying pesticide because these two bugs keep the uh, HWA in check, kind of a teeter-totter effect. Uh, good. Uh, and, and so that's the stability that we want to try, we want to try to achieve on the East Coast as well. But unfortunately, we, for whatever reason, haven't evolved any predator insects quite yet. Since again, for, uh, I'm trying to understand the cost of these two different applications. What is the cost for that? To, what did we pay 550 a tree for for the what, the yearly? Maybe I didn't hear that. And then what's the cost for the? the no, I, I'm sorry if I was. Let me let me close out this uh, question and answer box here. So still visible on my screen, and I trust on your screen is this compilation of our experience so far, where I've, I've said our uh, we all uh, have spent eight thousand five hundred dollars, forty percent on insecticide. Uh, we are trying to stretch our money as far as we as we can to do as many hemlocks, critical watershed hemlocks as we can. So we are using only the cheaper chemical, and that cheaper chemical is the imidacloprid. And so I don't have tabulated here or handy to me how many gallons of insecticide and mixed with water have so far been ap applied, but that's that's how we are stretching our money and getting a productivity rate, if you will, of about 550 per tree. The trees being the larger of the, of the species, like, as you see Jim treating here in his photo. The other chemical, the instant stop chemical, dinofurin, uh, is about um, two and a half or perhaps three times as expensive. And so, um, 
Um, I, I guess one could say that if we were spraying that exclusively, our cost per tree would be more like 15 or $16 per tree. And of course the two chemicals can be mixed together, which also results in a, a higher total cost. But um, the important point from the standpoint of Aula is we're stretching our money. We will be looking for more donations. Um, we've stepped into a 10 to 12 year campaign. I don't know that I mentioned um, the, the spraying can take place in the spring and in the fall, um, September, October and November, but the problem with fall application is that's also when deer hunting is underway. So, um, I, so Rick, uh, did I answer your question now finally? <laughs> yes, I, I'm, it's gone through my thick skull, I think. <laughs> I've understand it. Uh, the, uh, if you see the question and answer, Paul Teresi asking if how, how involved is it to train additional applicators in our region? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, Paul. Um, that's something that we ought to mutually step up to. Um, I think we ought to step up to, although people like Ben Zimmerman would, would maybe point out that there already are sufficient private applicator people and, and we all at least are just not making use of them so far. And I, I don't mean to Ben, I wish there was a way, Ben Zimmerman, I wish there was a way you could chip in an answer here live, maybe. But. I could go to the, the chat box. Uh, any other questions, anybody? Have I worn out my welcome? Uh, uh, Dana, I was muted, Rick, again. Uh, Dr. Tift has, has the overlying question about bringing in new bugs to our region for, you know, yeah, predators. Yep, yep. Jim, um, an excellent question, a, a worry on everybody's part. Um, we're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, if you will, or a rock and a hard place or some other bad, you know, analogy. Uh, we can't, we don't want to keep using insecticide. We've got to achieve some kind of biologic balance the experts at Cornell have tried under controlled conditions to see if these two insects from the West Coast have any adverse effect here in our East Coast ecology. They have not been able to identify any such adverse effects. And as I said earlier, these bugs seem to winter over okay, and maybe even especially better uh, given that climate change is making our winters easier, warmer, which isn't a good thing necessarily, I don't mean, but. So very much a worry. Um, and as you've probably heard before, Jim, um, trust us, uh, nothing bad will come of this. Uh, then uh, I see no further questions, so uh, thank you. Okay, well then, thank you everyone for your time and attention. Uh, I hope I gave you some useful information, some useful pointers. Again, go to the Cornell Hemlock Initiative website and um, you'll hopefully um, pick up a lot more information that I didn't just touch on. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Dana, I, I want to say thank you for spearheading this effort within our association and our watershed. It's uh, Thank you, Rick. Very much. Dr. Hall, on behalf of the Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes, many thanks for your insightful and informative presentation and for leading the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Mitigation Initiative for the Owasco Lake Watershed. And attendees, thank you for attending this webinar today. And please stay tuned for our remaining webinars throughout the course of this week. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone.